I'm going to give a perspective on 6G, the journey to 6G. So I loosely interpreted 5G++ as the journey to 6G. And we started on that journey in 2019, when we started uh, having the first keynotes and, and vision talks. And it was very much crystal ball gazing at the time. Three years later, the ideas start to crystallize. And we hear that in several talks, and I'll touch on a few of them. But before doing so, I want to start with an introduction on an online poll that we did, crowdsourced crystal ball. Uh, when we published our vision on, on 6G in a blog, we did an online poll and we asked three questions. So the first question was, what do you think is the defining application for the 6G era? And any guesses what the outcome was? Gaming. Gaming? So, uh, the, it, I'll, I'll get to the answers later. Then the, the, the other one uh, question was, what is the defining technology for 6G? Any guesses what, what the winner was there? ML, very close, yeah. Uh, AI, ML, and then uh, what is the most important KPI for 6G? Any guesses what the answer there was? Security, yeah, good. So here are the, the outcomes. So first on the, uh, the defining applications, that was the hardest one. Uh, the lowest number of responses, 700. And gaming, if you think of extended reality experiences, came out close, but, uh, close, but it is really an even distribution uh, in the noise. I, I, I put immersive experience and digital fusion, if you combine these together, then, then yes, we are in that metaverse uh, realm of, of applications and experiences. ML was mentioned as the uh, winner, as a, that is indeed true. AI clearly coming out as the most defining uh, technology for 6G, followed by cloud native architecture. So the, these two technologies really define and justify a next generation. And then on the defining KPI, there indeed security uh, was the winner that, that came out. So what I want to do for this uh, talk is structure it a bit along these three uh, themes. So I will start with uh, digital and physical fusion and, and the, how, the, how we experience and use that. Then I'll focus as a technology on AI and on cloud-based uh, architectures for the next generation. And then I'll, uh, as a third topic, uh, touch on security. So let's start with the digital physical fusion. Actually already since 2019, we've uh, started from the thesis that the defining application will be the fusion of digital and physical worlds. And Marco already mentioned this, uh, how we will be twinning in real time physical world with models in the digital world and also twinning our human worlds into the digital world thanks to massive deployment of sensors that uh, synchronously update these digital models and also massive deployment of AI that uh, enables us to have a continuous understanding of the state of the physical world of our uh, human uh, condition. And why is that important? Well, indeed, you can then transfer these models, recreate them in a holographic or 3D experience and have these uh, interactions with each other as if we were there. Uh, but then it's also about uh, digital twins that enable to enhance human productivity, to augment our human possibilities by anticipating needs, by the ability to simulate possible outcomes and then actually implement the most optimal outcome back into the physical world. And we have been uh, running projects to test this thesis with a digital twin of a smart factory, with digital twins of uh, vertical farming to optimize uh, the productivity in, uh, for instance, the air of farms in warehouses in New Jersey, or also more gimmicky maybe, uh, Alex Thompson race. So we sponsored a trans-oceanic uh, sailing champion, uh, Alex Thompson. And uh, with Bell Labs, we actually completely sensorized his boat. We completely sensorized his own uh, body to, to check his, his vitals and his sleep cycles, all with the goal to optimize his performance. 
I know this is a very focused uh, uh, use case, but you see the more general use case of augmenting human possibilities and productivity. Since 2019, metaverse became a thing. Uh, the company Facebook even changed its name to, to Meta, and since then, and they announced they want to be the platform for, for Metaverse, and since then, uh, the non-fungible token platforms and, and digital world platforms really started spiking. There's uh, economic reports that uh, explain the, the enormous potential of the Metaverse. And for instance, also at Mobile World Congress at, in Barcelona, Metaverse was really the talk of the town. And it was generally understood for our community that the network really needs to step up, that the network needs to provide orders of magnitude higher connectivity capacity to connect the compute capabilities that are required for the metaverse and to connect that with the end devices, not only in terms of capacity, but also into low latency uh, to have that extended reality experience without feeling uh, nauseated. But metaverse is often talked about still in this avatar social interaction way. Metaverse for us is, is a much bit bigger opportunity. It is about digital physical fusion. It's about human augmentation. There is a metaverse for industries where thanks to digital twinning, we can optimize productivity. There's a metaverse for enterprise, and Uli also touched on this in, in the previous talk, for collaboration, more efficient co-design from remote locations. And there is the metaverse for consumers, and not only the gaming, that was one of the suggested uh, defining applications, but then also, as Uli uh, illustrated uh, very eloquently, new shopping experiences. Oh. Taking it a bit closer to us, uh, metaverse for industry, so you have a digital twin of your factory, and that allows you to optimize positions of robots, the state of your machines, the state of your supplies, but it also helps for many people in the rooms, uh, wireless uh, researchers, to optimize uh, wireless communication and, and really use that fusion of worlds uh, for that purpose. Because today, for our wireless connectivity, we pretty much do this. We know very little about the RF signal strength in, for instance, a factory. The only thing we know is the feedback from the UE. Thanks to beamforming and AIML, we can start predicting. We have a better understanding of the signal strength. But ideally, so the analogy is the, the, the lighting the, the matchstick, then shining with a torchlight, but ideally we want to turn on the light in the factory and have a complete understanding of the RF signal strength in the factory. And we can do that because we have the perfect state of the factory in real time. We, we are sensing the position of the robots, we are sensing the position of the humans, and we can in real time with ray tracing models calculate the RF signal strength. GPUs from virtual reality, they are designed for ray tracing in visual, but they're equally powerful compute engines to do that in, in another spectrum. And then you can understand where, where shadow areas are. And this is a, a very useful tool that we are exploring to enhance critical wireless communication where you need the A299 reliability in industrial uh, communications. So this is one example close to our own field, how digital worlds can help optimize performance and taking it again to the larger point, uh, augment human possibilities. This is the first part of, of what I wanted to talk about. Now I want to get more to the technology. And at various conferences, we have somehow a consensus in the industry that there must be six technology challenges for 6G. And, and yeah, there's maybe seven or eight, but we combine them in a way so that we can talk about them in a comprehensive way uh, that there are six. And rather than going again through those six challenges, I want to focus on the two challenges that came out at the top of the uh, online poll as the defining new uh, technologies. So one, the, the, the cloud-based architectures, and then uh, the use in new ways of machine learning and AI. So let's start with the cloud. So the vision is that the future architecture will be completely based on a multi-cloud infrastructure. 
So there's the, the cloud of the web scalers, there is the cloud of the CSPs, of tower companies, private clouds of, of enterprises, a multi-cloud infrastructure. And on top of that, in a disaggregated cloud-native way, we will implement all the functions for 6G communication and sensing. So that is one important area uh, of ar architecture and, and uh, research challenges. The other area is the essential fabric that interconnects these cloud capabilities, but also in the, in, interconnects that with the wireless access point. So a op, mostly optical network fabric that provides a cap capacity and deterministic per performance. And then it is important to notice that this is a network of networks. There's CSP networks, there's data center networks, there's private networks, there is specialized localized networks, body area networks, car area networks, satellite networks. So it's really also a multi-stakeholder network. And a third big challenge area is how do you make that work in a frictionless way, in an automated way? And, and this is where AI will b play a big role to deal with the complexity and simplify the whole operation and automate the whole operation. The use of data will be very important and having architectures that allow for an efficient sharing of that data across the infrastructure to really optimally use uh, that with the AI models that, that are being trained and and, and you saw a cognitive data fusion plane. And the fusion refers not only to network data, but also application data that you pull in. Back to my example, for instance, of the factory and how you use that for RF uh, sensing. Uh, sorry, RF uh, communication. So that is one uh, area, the, the cloud-based architecture and then the use of AI. There is another way of uh, use of AI, AI that we are looking into, that is the use of AI over over the air interface. So you see here the, the classic way of transmitter and receiver, and for instance at the receiver you have the well-known blocks of, of synchronization, channel estimation, uh, equalization, uh, symbol demapper, and, and uh, decoding. And in present day research in 5G, we already look at how do we use ML to optimize for these functions. And then there is already the realization there's an opportunity for simplification of the machine learning by combining some of these functions. And in this way, reducing the number of layers. So we, we, we have this concept of deep RX machine learning. Uh, and it's not only about reducing complexity, but also about further improving the performance. You, one should realize that with every functional block separately, at those interfaces, you lose some information. And by keeping that stream whole, you maintain that and optimally use that information. So we've shown that you can actually get a two to three, two and a half dB better with these kind of approaches. So this is also, you can still uh, do in, in, in 5G. It, it becomes interesting in, in 6G where you then have a new air interface where both the transmit and the receive end uh, are completely machine learning based, and you have actually across the air interface a new uh, feedback loop that you can use for the training. And so the endpoints just learn how to communicate in the most efficient way. And, and also there we started with experimental work, and this is an example where the constellation is completely self-learned, so it's no longer that well-known regular quam grid, but it's uh, a pattern, a constellation pattern, probabilistic constellation shape pa pattern that is learned depending on the channel conditions. So, but talking about AI and applying it to communication begs for having, back to the fundamentals, a fresh look at how we communicate. And when we say back to the fundamentals, uh, let's go back to Shannon uh, when he published his work on the fundamental theory, mathematical theory of communication. It's, it's interesting in itself that he called it the mathematical theory, uh, because we're now in an era where we maybe need to have a fresh look at this. So his colleague actually wrote an introduction to that paper, and he said there's actually three levels of communication, Mr. Weaver. He said there's the level, the first level of bit and symbol communication, error-free transmission. But then there is a second level of communication, the semantic communication. Do I convey my meaning? And the third level of communication is the goal 
level, the effectiveness. Do I really achieve what I wanted to achieve with my communication? And so Shannon famously said, well, the semantic and all that, that is a human, uh, that's not part of the engineering problem. And so for decades, we looked at error-free transmission of bits and, and symbols. But now with the endpoints being machines and executing goals, it is time to have a fresh look and the goal-oriented and semantic uh, communication is part of the machine learn, uh, uh, is part of the engineering problem. Let me explain that with, with an example, a very simple example where you want to detect who is in the view of a camera. And there are such approaches where you do compressive sensing and you extract on one end, you have an engine that extracts the relevant features and then at another end of a communication link, you actually have an engine that checks with the beta database and identifies the people that are in the view of the camera. But actually the problem of identifying people and the problem of communication are treated separately. And very likely, we are ending up with suboptimal solutions, especially in a, in a wireless com IoT communication where channel varies, where you're power limited. So you, you see where this is going. Can we jointly optimize and apply across the, the application and the communication and come to a, a better more optimal solution dealing with the dynamics of the channel that we are transmitting across. So there's a whole uh, area and rise of research in semantic communication. So this is what's about the technology, so my, my second part of, of the talk. Now I get to the third part of the talk, security. As, uh, as you remember, one of the most important KPIs that came out of the poll. And I want to position it in the quantum uh, compute era. And uh, like several other uh, research institutes, we're uh, looking into quantum uh, computing also at Bell Labs and uh, such thing, uh, working on such things at, at qubits and, and qubit gates. And the whole challenge of this is that these things are working at extreme low conditions, close to, to zero Kelvin, uh, 25 millikelvin. So mostly if you see a picture of a quantum computer, you see these artistic plumbing structures which are there to cool these devices. Now, why is that so important for security? Well, there was another guy at Bell Labs, Peter Shore, that figured out that uh, you can effectively uh, do prime number uh, decomposition, factorial decomposition, and that is then an, a way of hacking into codes, and you can do that very efficiently with a quantum computer. And uh, so why does that matter? Because a quantum computer is still a decade out or more. Well, uh, you can hack, for instance, the 2048 RSA code, which is deemed very safe today. I mean, it takes centuries of compute with a regular computer to hack uh, such a code. Well, you, with a quantum computer, you will be able to decode that within hours. And that's already important today because you're storing data and in 10 years from now, that data may still be relevant. Think of national security or government information or just very embarrassing information. So this becomes an important challenge for, this, uh, for our research is how do you enable quantum safe encryption? And the other uh, element where quantum comes in is also quantum key exchange. We actually have a solution that we are already selling uh, to banks, for instance, where you do quantum key exchange and you use the entanglement and the ability of uh, detecting when you have an eavesdropper on, on your line. But there's many other challenges in the uh, security and, and, and trust area. There's a zero trust infrastructure and how do you enable a trusted service on a zero trust infrastructure? You need to preserve the privacy while you're operating and making changes in your infrastructure. There's such things as homomorphic encoding. And then also uh, using AI ML as a tool to improve your security, for instance, in anomaly detection. But AI ML is also a new threat, I mean, that try to bypass these anomaly detections. So we are entering a new cat and mouse game in the AI ML area, era. So that was the third part that I wanted to talk about. But before wrapping it up, 
uh, wireless, and many people are here in wireless research, came rather low in the opinion poll, but it is an important area still for the, the 6G research, and I, I want to finish with, with some uh, experiments that we've do been doing. We have actually demonstrated distributed massive MIMO in collaboration with, with AT&T. That's already for 5G advanced era, but this is a stepping stone to new cell-free architectures also in the 6G era. Then moving to higher frequency uh, parts, uh, the near terahertz, we are experimenting with new materials to fabricate these uh, near terahertz modules on glass, uh, a glass substrate that lows, allows for low uh, manufacturing cost while having good material properties for these frequencies. And then when you go to the terahertz frequencies, we also look into new device technologies like uh, resonant tunneling diodes. And this is a, a bit of an advertisement for our booth. We actually have a setup there to, to, to show some of that. And I'll be happy to um, meet you at the booth. I'll be there at, at 1 p.m. Happy to talk to especially students. If you have questions about my talk, you're very welcome. So to wrap it up, three things, three takeaways. Digital physical fusion to augment and liberate, unleash human possibilities. AI as a very important new technology for the 6G era and a food of, for thought, not only communication, but combined communication and application, and then making that all happen in a safe and trusted way. Thank you for your attention.